get to some of those here. All right, so the consequent nature, if you want to call it the, the ground, the ultimate ground of meaning. Okay, this is the other side, the, the physical side, if you want, of God. Why is it consequent? Well, for Whitehead, it's consequent because it follows upon the interactions between the primordial nature and the world. It follows upon the interaction, uh, the movement of the world. It's intimately related, right? It's God's physical prehension, God's feeling, incorporation of the world process in every moment. Okay, he says it's consequent upon the creative advance of the world. I want to get to some of these statements, and, and this relates, Jill, you couldn't, couldn't have brought up your question in a more perfect time, so that's that's great. So it, we were, the image of the consequent nature is not eternal, like the primordial nature. It's not unchanging like the primordial nature. It's that dimension of God which feels, which evolves with grow and grows with the world process at every single moment. It's the receptive nature of God, the savoring nature of God, the transforming nature of God in relation to what the world has achieved in each sort of moment. Okay, the world in each moment, to use Whitehead's language, is objectified in God. Remember, uh, an event perishes, it perishes into the life of God. It's realized in the unity of God's nature and through the transformation of divine wisdom. Well, in what way? Okay, this is the point I, I just sort of made, right? We're making this distinction in God. And remember, all the way back in metaphysics, the question of permanence, the question of change. These uh, are also involved in our understanding of God. So the consequent nature, if it's truly related to the world, is temporal. It's growing. It's moving. Why? Because the temporal and processual world is 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 what it is. It's a, a world in movement. Uh, put differently, it's the world that's consciously experienced by God as imprinted and transfigured by divine wisdom and value in an immortal sense. The consequent nature is like a divine memory. They cherished. The world imprints its life on God and God transforms and savors what God can uh, out of the world. Okay, this language of preservation, where an event might have realized something that is less than what it could be, and God cherishes that event and squeezes the type of good that can be out of that event, right? Notice where we're getting into this question of suffering, evil, loss, uh, triviality. The image under which this operative growth of God's consequent nature is best conceived is that of a tender care that nothing be lost. The consequent nature of God is his judgment on the world. He saves the world as it passes into the immediacy of his own life. It is a judgment of a tenderness which loses nothing that can be saved. It's also the judgment of a wisdom which, what, which uses what in the temporal world is mere wreckage. Another image which is also required da, 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 is that of infinite patience, tenderly saving the turmoil of the intermediate world by the completion of its own nature, of this own nature, his own nature. I forget what he uses there. It's a beautiful statement, right? That, that God, in a deep way, is judging the world. It's not in a negative sense, right? So you use the language, Jill, of test. It's sort of an interesting... I would, Ryan wouldn't say that. God's not testing you in every moment. It's more, it's more of a... Well, we're going to get there. <laughs> what do we name it that's happening? Okay, that's it's a great question. But what I want to notice, uh, note here simply is that the language of judgment, the language of wisdom, the language of patience, this is religious language, right? Judgment is not at all to be conceived uh, um, as a king judging. It's, it's judging what an ideal with what is real, what could have been with what is, right? A distinction between those things. All right, I know this is a lot of information. I'm going to do this one just because it's a, a real mouthful. Okay, in the consequent nature, and this is important, uh, Jill, this gets to your comment. God gives to suffering its swift insight into values which can issue from it. He is the ideal companion who transmute what has been lost into a living fact within his own nature. This transmutation of evil into good enters into the actual world by reason of the inclusion of the nature of God, which includes the ideal vision of each actual evil so met with a novel consequent as to issue in the restoration of goodness. God has in his nature the knowledge of evil, of pain, and of degradation, but is there as overcome by what is good. Every fact is what it is, a fact of pleasure, of joy, of pain, or of suffering. In its union with God, that fact is not a total loss. 
but on its finer side is an element to be woven immortally into the rhythm of mortal things. It's very evil become a stepping stone in which the all-embracing ideals of God, uh, in the all-embracing ideals of God, every event, he says, on its finer side introduces God into the world. God's ideal vision is given based in actual fact to which he provides the ideal consequent as a factor saving the world from the self-destruction of evil. The power by which God sustains the world is the power of himself as the ideal. God lives, or the world lives, by its incarnation of God in itself. Okay, beautiful, beautiful statements. Now, the idea here, notice that the language again, the closeness of companionship, that there's no doubt that evil enters the world. There's no doubt that things are less than they could be. That God has to face that fact. The judgment of God is to realize that in the very next moment, offer the ability to restore what has been lost in terms of goodness, right? To meet every single possibility that is less than it could be with another possibility that is more than what it previous was, previously was. So God has this image of evil, this, this knowledge of evil, certainly, but it's not there as realized to say that God's nature is evil. But if God's the ground of the possible, it seems we have to face the idea that there's evil possibilities. There's evil worlds that could exist. Worlds, I mean, imagine a world of uh, positive suffering. We should hope it doesn't exist, right? If there's a goodness in the, in, in, in the life of God, why right, not even says that, that the relationship of God to the world suggests that intrinsic chaos is impossible. That God is that element that is overcoming evil with good in every single moment. God's not controlling the world because it's not up to God what you do with the possibilities God gives you. But God can meet what you've done with a new possibility of goodness. Now, sort of to Jill's point, is this a test? I wouldn't call it a test. So what do we call this relationship between, to be, uh, between God and the world? Okay, between, right, on the one hand, the gift of ideal possibility to the world process. Two, the world's acceptance or deviation of this ideal in terms of actualization. And three, God's inhalation or preservation of the world's choice as transfigured, as transformed by divine wisdom. Okay, well, you can see that it's sort of a movement from God to the world and back again, right? From possibilities of value to worldly actualization to divine incorporation and to the next moment where God initiates the entire process again. What do we call this whole process? Is, is there one word that we can that we can think of? It may not be immediately present, but Whitehead calls it love. He calls it the love of God for the world, which involves for him uh, providence, companionship, and a deep sense of mutual suffering. God, as Whitehead has said, is also a tragic being because God suffers with the world. God faces the fact that the ideals of the divine nature are not realized in the world, and God suffers because of it. The kingdom of heaven is with us today. This action is the love of God for the world. It is the particular providence for particular occasions. What is done in the world, two ends, is transformed into a reality in heaven, and the reality of heaven passes back into the world. By reason of this reciprocal relation, the love in the world passes into the love of heaven and floods back again into the world. In this sense, and this is one of Whitehead's most famous statements, God is the great companion, the fellow sufferer who understands. If we're thinking about the problem of evil. If God is outside the world, controlling the world, doesn't feel with the world, it's hard to imagine how one could in any way provide a, a way to think through the problem of evil. If God is imminent in the world, God suffers with the world, if God's relation to the world is not a king but a companion, that means something different. God, too, suffers the detriments of our disregard. Right? We can think of that uh, racially, environmentally, um, um, and all over these different issues that we've been encountering, especially in the, the past year. Okay, I want to, let's finally, to conclude, I want to apply this to your life and then give a really imperfect analogy as to thinking about it. I almost didn't include it because I think it's sort of sort of trivial, but it gives us a, <laughs> one way to think about it. Okay, imagine, we have to imagine, your particular occasion, your series of occasions, okay, a remarkably integrated 
uh, inheritance of occasions that make you who you are. So imagine that God in every moment is offering you the best possible version of yourself and awaiting your actualization and decision, right? And this possibility comes at you among many other possibilities that buy for your attention. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's say you make a decision. You actualize a possibility other than what God had intended for you in some sense. And God's role in the next moment is to offer you yet another best version of yourself given the new context, and await your response again. Okay, it's a fundamentally relational vision, if you want, of call and response. This is the language that Marjorie uh, Suhaki has used. God calls and the world responds. God incorporates what the world's response is, and God calls again, and the world responds. And it's this sort of infinite relationship between God uh, and the world that Whitehead is getting at. And finally, again, I, I almost didn't include it, because it's sort of trivializing let's play with it a little bit imagine god is a cosmic sort of gps a god positioning system or a what is it what, what else could we say uh, it's god's a persuasive self perhaps gps right if god is this sort of cosmic gps system offering you the best possible route in the course of your existence in every moment Okay, either decision, every decision you make in some way is going to either align or deviate from this route. And if you make a wrong turn, I'm trying to make this applicable, God's new offering is the next best way to get you back on track towards a divine vision for your life. A divine vision of, of, of value. Recalculating. Rec <laughs> Very good. <laughs> So God as a GPS is leading you and leading the world by the divine vision of truth, beauty, and goodness. Now we're, we're back to value and how these values can be incarnated, right? He sort of uses that language uh, into your own, your own life, into your own existence. Recalculating. That's funny. Um, okay. I know.